I'm Stacy Sullivan in HR. I'm just doing the introduction, so I won't be talking about any of the genome stuff. Um, so first of all, who today is going to try the spit, the spit thing? Just curious, show, show of hands. And we don't know, you might change your mind after the presentation as well. <laughs> We're really, really excited to have 23andMe here. This is just, we think it's going to be a really fun experiment. Um, basically, hear more about the company, about their technology, and you know, to also see what kind of interest um, Googlers have in you know, finding a little bit more about your genetics. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce Linda Avey, one of the co-founders from 23andMe. Um, there's two co-founders, right? And then the second one is, um, I think everybody probably knows, is Anne Wojcicki, right there, Sergey's wife. No conflict of interest. This is something we want to do independent of the relationship with Sergey. <laughs> so um, so th um, they're going to give um, a brief, well, there'll be a talk. This is the tech talk part. And then um, the spit opportunity and Q&A, and um, they'll go through the whole thing. You may have noticed there was asparagus in some of the cafes today, so hopefully you, you uh, ate some of that that may be part of this as well. OK? Linda, on to you. Do you want to do podium? Or? Yeah, I'll just okay. do podium. If you want this, it's something All right, thank you. This is working. Um, thank you, Stacy, and um, thank you to Google for having us today. We've been talking about doing this for so long that it's so great to have it finally happen. Um, so what I'm going to do is just give a little bit of background about 23andMe um, and then go through a little bit about our personal genome service, just to give you a bit more flavor about what we do. Um, I think we sort of take Google for granted that you guys all know about us, and we're over off Bayshore doing our thing. And um, I think it's probably a wrong assumption for, you, for us to think that you guys know exactly what we're up to. So we'll go through that in a bit more detail. Uh, but Anne and I met, uh, I guess, over two years ago and came together with a lot of the same ideas about why we wanted to do a company like 23andMe. And a lot of it stems from frustration that we both had with the lack of progress in using genetics to really improve health care. It's a really long way away from us being able to go to a doctor, present our genetic information, and have our doctor say, OK, check, check. You should take this drug. You shouldn't take that drug. You are allergic to certain things. And you definitely should avoid certain um, types of exposures. And we really want to get to that point someday, and everyone talks about personalized medicine, but it's just going to be too far off, we think, and so that's why we wanted to start this company, to get genetic information into the hands of a lot more people, and then get them to share that information if they're comfortable with that, so that we can get to a point where we know more about our genomes. So um, with that, oh, and then just um, really quick, I noticed some people are eating, and if you do plan to spit today, you should wait about 30 minutes between eating and spitting. When we were at World Economic Forum giving a lot of kits away, that wasn't the case, and we ended up with some pretty gross samples. So, um, <laughs> so uh, just to get started, um, uh, this is a rendering of the DNA molecule that, of course, everyone knows we have coursing around and coiled up in our cells. And uh, because we're human beings, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, typically. Not everyone, but most people. And that's why we all walk around mostly on two legs, have two arms, two ears, two eyes, and nose, that, because our DNA is about 99.5% the same. But it's really the these SNPs, as we call them, that make us unique individuals. And this is, these are the points, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, that, that are unique to us. And so what we do as a company is we measure about 580,000 of these markers in everyone's genome. And then we are able to take that information and give you a lot of context about what do these SNPs really mean? What information can we learn about ourselves through studying these SNPs? So because we use the technologies that are also used by the research community, and these tools have been in their hands now for a couple of years, we're starting to see a flood of publications coming out. So there are SNPs now being found to be associated with a variety of diseases. And it's a really exciting time. Our scientists, a lot of them are in the back, are reading up on the literature as these papers come out. And what we do is we translate the information coming from these publications and give you this information specific to your genome. So we do give, put the right caveats around it that this is just new information. It's not clinically validated yet. But we do find that from early reports from our customers that they want more and more information. So we'll get into that further here. So um, it's really all about human diversity that we're interested in celebrating and exploring. And so this is really our journey together as a community to really start looking into what do all of these SNPs mean. 
So what can you learn about you when you join up and, and become a member of the 23andMe community? Well, for one thing, um, we don't know if this will happen or not, but we think that, um, you know, people obviously know based on their birth date what their sign is. Maybe we could change from a bar scene to someone asking your sign to what is your haplogroup? Um, and in this case, we're looking at a maternal haplogroup page that is part of your account when you sign up. And because we've put mitochondrial markers in the panel that we, we create for you, this genetic information inc includes these markers from your mitochondria. And of course, I think most of you probably know you got your mitochondria from your mother. She got it from her mother and all the way back through your maternal line. So what we're seeing on this map is basically where the H3 haplogroup, where people with this haplogroup were living about 500 years ago. So this is my haplogroup assignment. Um, it gives a lot of wealth of information about this. We have stories about these. If you click on these tabs, and then there's a tree of all of the maternal haplogroups. So if you know what other haplogroups people have, you can see how you relate to them potentially. Uh, we're very lucky to have hired Joanna Mountain from Stanford, who joined us from the anthropology department at Stanford. She's a population geneticist, and she and her team have been doing an incredible job of really building out this information. We have write-ups, I think, on over 80 haplogroups now, so it's really a phenomenal resource uh, and really fun to read all of this information about yourself. Um, the other thing you can see here down in the lower right, this thing isn't quite working, um, are uh, a list of names, and what this is are, are people that I'm already sharing my information with. That's another thing with 23andMe is you're able to share, if you choose, certain portions of your genetic information. And we have two levels now of sharing the first one being the ability to share at more of a basic level, where you might have a lot of friends who you find out are also in 23andMe, and you might want to compare your haplogroup versus theirs. Uh, there's also extended sharing that I'll show you later on that gets more into the health information that you might want to share with your family members. The other thing we do along this line is we have paternal haplogroups where uh, if you're a man and you, have a, and you have a Y chromosome, which should be most of you, um, you can learn through the markers of your Y chromosome that you got from your father this same type of information where your paternal line might have uh, originated from. So we don't just stop there. Uh, a lot of ancestry companies focus on these two components, the mitochondria and the Y chromosome, but we take it to the next level and we've just added a new feature recently that we call ancestry painting. And what this shows is basically um, chromosome one at the top down through chromosome 22 at the bottom. And we're looking at an African-American man right now. And based on this, this view of his genome and the way it's painted, he shows up to be about 64% European, 33% African. So the indication could be that he's probably half European. Uh, and it could, you know, one could argue that this might be what Barack Obama might look like if we painted his chromosomes. Um, and then you compare this to a woman who is Native American. And you can see in this case, the color orange represents Asia, and she's about 83% Asian. So again, we have explanations about how we go through someone's genome and make these assignments of which chunk should be colored which way. And for people like me, it's unfortunately sort of boring. It's pretty much all European. So if you looked at my chromosome painting, it would be pretty much solid navy blue. Um, so we're always ecstatic when we find people who have these beautifully mixed backgrounds and their chromosomes paint so wonderfully like this. So in addition to looking into your ancestry then, as I mentioned earlier, you're able to share your genome with other people to a certain extent. And in this case, what we're showing are two siblings who've been compared to each other. So these are siblings who have shared their accounts, and these are actually part of a demo family that we have. If you s just want to set up a demo account, you don't want to sign up yourself, you're able to do that now and look through the eyes of the Mendel family at their genomes. And it's a real family, but we've just changed their names to protect the innocent. Um, but in this case, we're comparing uh, Aaron and Ian Mendel, who are definitely siblings, and you can see that now in their genomes, the way they compare the dark parts here are where they're 100% similar. The light blue parts are where they're half similar. And then where they're, you see the white gaps here, that's where they're not similar at all. So even between two siblings, you can see where they look like they are very similar. So then the other thing we allow you to do is to click on certain uh, clusters of genes. And in this case, we've clicked on the immune system compatibility which shows up on chromosome six, and that's what these red arrows are pointing at. And in this case, these two uh, 
this brother and sister look like they're 100% similar in their um, part of their genome that dictates their immune systems. We don't know that this, there would be utility in this information yet of whether they could be donors for each other, but it does raise a provocative question, and we will continue to pursue this to see if that is indeed the case. Um, so um, if you click on other parts of this bitter tasting, that will point to different parts of the genome that you would be able to see, do I have the same taste as a sibling or not? So it's, it's actually a lot of fun. I've done my entire family, including my three other siblings, my parents, and um, my kids, and it's just been a, a really interesting time to look at all of our genomes together. So beyond this, then, um, the other area, of course, that we get a lot of questions is, you know, what does this mean for me and my health? And we, when we launched last November, we had our, our scientists had gone through the literature and found about 14 really solid genetic associations that we wrote up in the form of these gene journals. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is a printout basically of different phenotypes or diseases or characteristics that we know um, some ab something about the genetics. And when we first started out, we had 14 that were what we considered established research, which is this category you see here with four stars. So you can see some of them within this alphabetical list right now. But the, the early response we got from our customers is they wanted way more information. So we sort of opened up what we were willing to share back with our customers based on genetic associations that didn't quite meet the criteria for established research. So we created the second category called preliminary research. And the way we differentiate all of these different publications coming out has a lot to do with the study size. Of course, a lot of this is all about statistical power. And if you have a very small population that you've been looking at a particular trait, you may not have a lot of confidence in what you're finding. And so our scientists go through this process of, of deciding which category this should go into and then how many stars it should get. So for example, avoidance of errors uh, only has one star. But because of the phenotype, of course, people are very interested in that. I know Sergey had a lot of problems with this particular one. Um, but it's it, it shows up in the, in the New York Times because people are, journalists find this stuff intriguing, so they want to write about it. So we feel like it's our way to, to give you a little bit more information about this particular study to say, yeah, it's interesting, but it's, it only gets one star. And anecdotally, we've already heard our customers saying, oh, well, that's a one star. I'm not going to pay attention to that one. So that's exactly the idea that we want to start educating people about what does all this mean and how seriously should you really take it. So I'm just going to dive into one of these in particular uh, because type 2 diabetes is just such a problem globally. Uh, we have uh, a, a gene journal written about this. So the way we organize the information is we give background information about the disease. There's a lot of of tabs that you can click on to get more information, information about the, the disease, the timeline for when. And it's fascinating to read about these. Some of these diseases have been characterized back from, I think, the 1600s or even earlier. So it's, it's just kind of interesting to know that people back then were dealing with some of these same problems. Uh, we have an MD's perspective for some of these, where if a doctor uh, was confronted with a patient who had printed out information from their gene journal, how should a doctor react to that? And in some cases, what we do is we just work with a physician who also has a very good understanding of genetics. And they might do research. They might have a clinic and a lab, MD, PhDs often. And so they are able to write to, the, to another doctor, to a colleague, to say, look, this is really early information. There's not a lot we can do about that. But that's okay to tell the patients that, that they should know this is early research. Um, so then the other thing we do then, and what we're doing, because we're logged in right now as Greg Mendel, we're looking at his data. And right now we have a pretty good understanding of nine genes that are associated with type 2 diabetes. These have been studied in large populations. They've been validated and replicated in other populations. So we're feeling that these nine genes are going to stand the test of time, that they are going to continue to be known to be associated with type 2 diabetes. The different colors represent the versions of the genes that Greg has. So in his case, he's got um, seven of the nine that show up with the green coloring, which means his versions of these genes don't increase his risk versus the two that do, which show up as red. So we try to make this, these visualizations pretty easy for people to interpret. But if you want to dive into more information, if you click on each one of these boxes, it gives you information about the gene, references to the publications where the studies were, you know, where they found these associations. So we really let people dive in as much as they want about the information behind it. 
So taking all of this into account, then what we do is we can give you an odds calculator based on these genes. And um, there, there's a lot more work to be done as far as really knowing how do these ge genes work in concert. We don't know if they act independently or if some of them are in the same pathways. So there's a lot more to be learned about these particular genes. But in Greg's case, as you can see, his risk now based uh, compared to average is about 5.6 out of 100 versus an average of 9.4 out of 100. The thing to keep in mind is that you do have to assume some things, in this case, a European ancestry. If you're from India, these data may not apply to you. So you need to remember that a lot of studies are done in, uh, in European populations. And that's something that we really want to try to address. And I'll get to that later on in the presentation about wanting to open up research studies into other populations. Do you have a question? in African because it's somewhat arbitrary. Europeans are just people who wandered out of Asia, Asia out of Africa. Yeah. Well, it has to do with um, the haplot type structure that you have in your genome, and that has been, it, it has sort of migrated over time so that certain clusters of people like Europeans have similar haplot type structure and people of Asian ancestry also. The more information we get about distinct populations, the more we'll be able to fine tune these, these data points. But right now, we just don't, studies aren't really conducted in, unless you're from Iceland, um, where there are, you know, there are studies going on in that very isolated population. But um, there are some assumptions that we have to make. But, and like I'm saying, this is all beginning. It's all in the early stages. And hopefully, we'll be able to dive deeper into specific populations with, as we, we get more people enrolled. Question in the back? Yeah. Are you planning to uh, gather information about known medical conditions of, of some of your customers and make that data available in an anonymized form to researchers? <laughs> to researchers? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll get into that further. In the, maybe if I just get through the presentation and then we'll, but yeah, we definitely plan to do that. Um, so really quick then, just finishing up with, um, oh, the other point I want to make is that with type 2 diabetes, um, it's only about 26% genetic, so your environment obviously has a, a much bigger impact on whether or not you're going to get this disease. So that's the other thing to keep in mind, that we all know we should work out and eat well and all of that. But uh, we are finding that um, some of our early customers who have found out that they look at like they're at higher risk for type 2 diabetes have indeed taken that information into account. And even though they are in really good shape, they're really keeping a better eye on their diet and how they're taking care of themselves. So we take that as a really good sign that people can use this information in a very positive way. So the way we've built 23andMe is that we take security of our customers' data to the highest degree. And I, I think I'm speaking to the choir here, that you guys are very much of the same mind. And all of our systems have been built to protect the information. Uh, for instance, we keep your genetic information completely separate from what we call your personal information, which is if you order online, you'll give us your credit card and your address. Those are kept in completely separate databases. And I think we have a couple of engineers here. If you wanted to get more information about this, we'd be happy to go th through that specifically. We have a privacy policy online. And um, one of our lead engineers is probably one of the most paranoid people in a very good way that I've ever met. And he is, you know, he, he himself said, you know, I'm not going to do this service until I know that we have a privacy policy in place. And so we felt like he's the perfect guy to really be leading up all of the security and privacy of our system. So um, we just feel like we wouldn't have a solid company and we couldn't gain the trust of our customers unless we built this in the right way. So why did we do this now? So when Ann and I met a couple years ago, um, we felt like the stars had really aligned in such a way that it made sense to, to try to bring personal genetics to the world. And one of, that had, one of the factors had to do with the cost of genotyping. Uh, Affymetrics is a company down the road. Illumina is in San Diego. They've created these genotyping arrays where the cost has dropped phenomenally over even the last five years. What we're doing today probably would have cost almost a half a million dollars even five or seven years ago. So now for $1,000, you're able to get 580,000 data points, which gives you a really good coverage of your genome. And that's why the researchers are using these tools now in what they call the genome-wide association studies. So we felt like you know $1,000 is still a fair amount of money. Um, you guys are getting a great deal today at $499. Um, and we'll have information about how you can go about ordering 
during the service if you want to do it here today. The other thing that we do then, in addition to working with the research arrays, is Illumina is the platform we've chosen because they give us the ability to develop a custom set of, of markers in addition to the research markers that we have. And what, we've look, what we decided we wanted to include are things like drug interaction genes because we really want to start collecting information to the question in the back. We want to find out what drugs people have taken that have worked for them, drugs that have, they've taken that haven't worked for them. Are you allergic to certain antibiotics? All of that wealth of information that people have that even their doctor may not know about them. I know my doctors don't know that I'm allergic. To, well, it's in my record somewhere, but every time I go in, they say, what are you allergic to? They don't seem to really have a good system for keeping track of all this information. Whereas now it will be in one place, and then we'll hopefully be able to do research studies. If we get enough people who say, I get a stomach ache when I take Advil, we will have all of the genes well covered that... that influence how your body reacts to a drug. Some people can do really well on, on uh, Advil, and some people get horrible stomach aches, and we want to know why that is. So the other thing we have coverage, as I mentioned before, is uh, the ancestry genes. Um, we also have really good coverage of genes that have been known to be associated with different types of cancer. And then the HLA region as well, which is really uh, an interesting part of the genome for immune-based uh, diseases. Um, and then, of course, um, especially Google is uh, aware of what's going on in the whole next generation sequencing space. So we're very excited and keeping a close eye on how that field is moving forward. And we're very excited to transition our service to whole genome sequencing at some point. But we think it's still far too early for that. And, and we're talking with a lot of these sequencing companies to see who's going to win this, this grand horse race that's going on right now. Um, and then the other great news is that GINA, which is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, uh, has now finally passed both the House and the Senate, and our wonderful present, president has uh, promised to sign it. <laughs> um, it might be one of the last great things he does in his presidency. So we're really thrilled that this after 12 or 13 years, is finally getting to a point where it will be against the law for a company to discriminate against you based on your genetics or for a health insurance company. So that was one of the big hurdles that we felt was holding people back from really wanting to get access to their own genetic information. And so now hopefully this will give security or give people a, a better feeling about that. So one of the other reasons that we felt like the timing was right for launching 23andMe um, is really based on what we're seeing happening, and it's, it's really in younger generations, but people who are now willing to share information on the web through things like Facebook, YouTube, MySpace, all of these websites that allow people to really share their information. And um, this is the phenomenon that we want to tap into now. And so within the next couple of months, you'll see new features through our service that will uh, let you fill out surveys. So we're going to have a variety of surveys that we'll put out. And um, by answering the information in those, this is how we'll be able to start collecting information to give us the ability to do our own genome-wide association studies. We're going to be announcing some partnerships very soon in specific disease areas where we're going to go out and recruit people to come into 23andMe so that we can start these studies very proactively. So in addition to um, the Web 2.0, we're starting to see this now in the healthcare space with companies like Patients Like Me and Sermo. Patients Like Me is a social network for people with specific diseases. They started out with Lou Gehrig's or ALS and have now branched, I think, into about four or five other disease areas. But it allows people to share their information online in a very open and public way about the progression of their disease. And it's proving to be a really successful model. Um, and then Sermo is a way for doctors to share information with each other. Um, there was, I saw their CEO give a talk where there was a picture of a finger with a little saw through it or something, and the, he po posted the picture up on Sermo, and another doctor came through with an idea of just to cut, I forget what he, some piece of plastic that you put in to pull the blade out. I mean, it was just gross, but that was a, the solution came through Sermo of how to treat this person's finger. So it really is fascinating to see this phenomenon happening. And what's interesting is what they tell us at Sermo is that the doctors that they're finding signing up are not necessarily the young docs coming out of medical school, but it's doctors in practices in the Midwest who are really isolated and on their own. And now suddenly they can use the web to really open up their practice and open up their experience level so that they have access to far more information, which we think is phenomenal. So this leads then to our um, branching out into this new field of what we're calling Research 2.0, uh, because now we're taking these elements together 
the, the technologies to do the genotyping and the web and enabling people to share information about their health so that we can start doing these studies. We will collaborate with researchers, but we really find that the, the bioinformatics capability that we have at 23andMe will be something that the research community will find very useful. There are not many researchers that you talk to really know how to b write algorithms and do um, these queries of databases to come to answers to questions they have about a disease they're studying. So that's the expertise we'll have in-house. And then we'll go to researchers and say, look, we have 10,000 people in our database who have Parkinson's disease. What kind of questions would you want to ask of them? And so we can help or get help uh, designing the surveys as well as help on what kind of questions should we be asking of the data, and then hopefully be publishing our own results in the not too distant future. So this concept really um, is what we call 23 and We, and uh, we are um, very excited about this opportunity, and um, we'll be, uh, as I said, putting out some press releases about how we're going to very proactively start down this path. You're switch so finally, um, the other thing that you guys might have been reading about are some of the um, questions coming up from the state of New York and uh, the state of California about this whole new field of personal genetics. And so we're constantly in discussions with all of the stakeholders in this, in this new uh, brave new world that we're in. Uh, and you know, there's the acronym of ELSI, which is the ethical, legal, and social implications of this. And so we, we do take this very seriously and we're very engaged with these different departments of health and the federal government about how do we regulate the space in a meaningful and positive way, but don't stop the innovation. Because that is something that if the regulators put too firm of a hand on this, we feel like it could stop it in its tracks. But there have been publications out that say that the genome's out of the bottle and and it's happening, and we fully agree with that. So, um, but for today, we've decided it's we're going to take a little bit um, different approach to LC, and this is now going to be the Eric, Larry, Sergey investigations. So, um, so we're excited now to do the next part of the presentation, and Anne is going to join me here. We have to switch computers, so we'll need just a second to do this. So um, we've been very fortunate to have the, the pleasure of, of actually having access to Sergey, Larry, and Eric's genomes. Um, and they were actually so kind enough to entrust us to say we can investigate them thoroughly and actually present them to you. So um, because your legal team wanted to do a legal review, I've had to give you the PG version of what we could have actually presented. Um, <laughs> there were there were some there were some really great photos I was going to use, um, but <laughs> but but I really want to have a good relationship with Eric. So um, <laughs> so so Are you here by the way. <laughs> yes. Um, so so what we've done is we've just kind of taken interesting little tidbits from the account. Anyone who wants to come up and play with the account more and see how we got to these things, you're more than welcome to. But I think a lot of you who are sitting on the chairs, you can see that you had a one page. And we're really going to make this interactive and make this actually as a, as a survey to see how well you know your, your fearless leaders. So um, one, of, one of your fearless leaders came from Doggerland. Um, we want to know how many of you actually know where Doggerland used to be. <laughs> It's a very educated crowd. So I actually didn't know this either yet, but it's, it's, it turns out that's actually England over there on the left and France below, but there actually used to be, the English Channel used to be blocked by this land. And so let's guess, Sergey, how many people think Sergey came from this area? Larry? Oh, yeah. And Eric? Wow. Oh, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it was Larry. Okay, you saw the chromosome painting. So um, two, two of the individuals came back very blue, absolutely no diversity, but one person actually had a little bit of Asian. So let's do it again. Sergey, Larry, and how about Eric? Oh, you're right. <laughs> Sergey. 
Looks like Thomas Jefferson wants to join your board. <laughs> So, so someone in this group actually shares their haplogroup with uh, Thomas Jefferson. Paternal, right? Their paternal haplogroup, actually, yeah, with Thomas Jefferson. So again, we'll do it. Sergey, Larry, and Eric. Wow. Oh, I won't even give you a clue this time. Oh. <laughs> do they look similar? <laughs> What feature is most similar? <laughs> so we know Brussels sprouts are very popular in this crowd. Um, so we actually have one of our gene journals is about bitter tasting. And it makes that you know, some people absolutely love things like Brussels sprouts, and some people really don't. So someone in this crowd is less sensitive to bitter tastes and therefore might love Brussels sprouts. So let's do it again. Sergey? Larry or Eric? I don't see either uh, Eric or Larry voting. <laughs> Looks like Eric. I actually was going to try to make the little Brussels spouts into the balls that are all over here, but I'm not that talented. So I know that this is also a very athletic group. Um, so if you had to choose either Sergey, Larry, or Eric, this is not from Burning Man. Um, <laughs> If you had to choose either Sergey, Larry, or Eric to be on your sprinting team, who would want Sergey? Who would want Larry? And who would want Eric? <laughs> Why? <laughs> oh, and it turns out Larry actually, Larry was very impressive. Larry is homozygous for the fast twitching. So this is a gene journal that we have, which is associated with fast twitching muscle. And Larry actually is homozygous, so meaning he has two copies of it. And Eric, I'm sorry, you, you don't have any. But <laughs> you could still be a really great long distance runner. Oh, so Eric actually was. So. Oh, wow. So don't challenge him to any endurance sports. Yes. <laughs> You're learning that. So this, this, this one, I, I, I personally feel this one should be really obvious. Um, one, of your <laughs> one of your fearless leaders is not sensitive to sweaty odors. <laughs> OK, let's, let's, let's guess. Sergey? <laughs> Larry? And Eric. Oh, yeah. so, so who refuses to change out of their biking clothes? <laughs> <laughs> Ger Sergey did this pose so willingly. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that there's a lot of meetings. I have this problem sometime at home. Sometimes I say things, and there's absolutely no memory. So. You have a meeting. Who is most likely to actually remember what you said in that meeting? This, again, is from a Gene Journal article. It's preliminary research. It's, it's early stages still, but there might be some, some ideas that you have. So, Sergey, <laughs> I concur with you. Larry and Eric. Oh, very good. <laughs> Eric. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that's something you say a lot. <laughs> I also I could only find very serious pictures of you online. But you're always looking like you're listening. It's good. So I know that there's a lot of dairy in here. Um, I, I've always been very jealous of your itsits. Um, we actually want a special order, too. But who, you know, there's one of your leaders who cannot actually process dairy. Who's, if you see actually eating an itsits, you should clamp down. So Sergey, Larry, and Eric. Oh, not a lot of voters here. Seems like you don't know. They must all eat a lot of ice cream. <laughs> so Sergey has actually been complaining about this at home, that he's you know, lactose intolerant. But it turns out that he actually he is. So now I have to give him a little credibility. So last, as some of you, 
So as some of you might have noticed, um, we have we actually a lot of us here have the T-shirts about the peeing, and and this gets a little bit into the research 2.0 concept that Linda was talking about. Is that there's some of these really basic questions that we don't know the answers to. So we don't we know there's there's great thought thinking that this is a genetic trait, but we actually don't know. Somehow no one has ever gotten an NIH grant to study this. But, but this is a project that 23andMe wants to take on. And one of your fearless board members, Art Levinson from, Genetic, from Genentech, was also very interested in this area. So you can see that over time, this is an area we might actually start asking you questions about. So I haven't gotten confirmation from Eric actually on this, but I do remember asking once before, and I, I don't think I got the traditional, like, what are you talking about response? So, um, so let's ask the question now. Sergey, Larry, and Eric. Oh, and they actually all can. <laughs> So again, this is one of those great areas. We've had a few um, priceless moments where we start talking about it and people stare at us like, why are you asking me about my pee? Um, so again, this gets into the 23 and we concept. Um, it's something that it's a fun example of it, but we really are, you know, Linda and I have been, you know, criticized for being a little bit too idealist, but we really think that we can change the world with something like 23 and we. And we think that this is just an example of something that everybody in this room can relate to um, where we don't know. It's such a basic concept, but we don't know. And questions like this, you know, even starting to get this information from people and the information from you, you know, what drugs have you taken? What are you most interested in? What have you had adverse events for? We really think that we can change healthcare. And we're personally very vested in this. I want it changed in five years. It just, it's, it's, we've, ha we've spent, you know, I've spent a decade in it, Linda spent 20 years in this. It has to change, and that's all what we're about. So I think we'll open it up now for questions. We also have a very educated team of um, scientists and engineers here. So as, as we need you guys, we'll just call you up. Um, so I've heard that a lot of the potential for variation among humans is actually in copy number variation and not only in um, SNPs. Do you have any plans for looking towards that in the future? Yeah, I don't, is this thing on? Um, yeah, we're definitely looking to, um, part of what we can do with the SNPs that we're um, collecting the information on, you can actually start looking at copy number variation. So one of our scientists is starting to look at the, those analyses, and if we do, find that within the data sets we're generating for our customers that we can start reporting back copy number variation findings, we will do, definitely do that. But uh, there are new array designs that okay. take into account more copy number. Um, uh, they have the ability to measure copy number more directly than through SNPs. But it's, it's definitely a very interesting area, and we're starting to see publications coming out. Thanks. So we, we're, we're genotyping people right now on a standard array, 550,000 SNPs, plus a custom panel of 30,000. And right now, we're, we feel it's a really robust tool that should be useful for a long time. So that's the platform that we're using. As new research comes out, which is weekly, we update our site. So right now we've been on you know, a bi-monthly schedule. If there's new articles or there's new information that's coming out, we're updating it continuously. So you get 580,000 data points. Not all of them can we guarantee are going to match with the research, but a very good percentage of them will. So at some point, you know, we definitely, like Linda was, uh, was talking about, at some point we definitely want to go down the path of full sequencing. There's a question over here. Do we have the mic? Yeah. Hi. Um, where do you stand on data portability with regards to my sequence information? Data portability? Oh, as far as you being able to take your information, or I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, so you can download your file uh, right off the website so that we have a, a place where you just click and it says download your data. So you get your full data set. Unfortunately, some early customers thought that meant where that's where they got their data and they'd end up with this big file that they had downloaded. So we're making it more clear that that's where you actually get this string of A's, G's, T's, and C's. But yeah, you absolutely can get it. But it'd be great for people who, I mean, again, this is an engineering crowd. We realize there's a lot of creative things people can do with it. So any of you who want to download your data and, and create interesting programs with it, you're more than welcome. Question over here. Yeah. Okay. So 
as you discover new things, I mean, as, as somebody figures out that, oh, look at that, this gene means you're going to fall over dead in three years, um, will you be sent, you know, sending out alerts to people like, <laughs> by the way, you have this gene. <laughs> Yes, we will do Google type alerts. Um, yeah, it's you know, that's one of the things too that we find that people before they get their data are a little hesitant and a little trepidatious about it. But then once they get their data, they realize this is so many shades of gray. And especially the the research that's coming out now is mostly on multigenic disease, which typically also has an environmental component. So even with all of the genes that get stacked up that are known to be associated, your overall risk profile in a lot of cases oftentimes doesn't change all that much. So this does, is not definitive data that, that will give you that black and white of information. One of the things that we often compare it to is cholesterol. So you know, you might find out that if you have high cholesterol, it's a risk marker for heart disease, but it's not going to tell you, you're not going to get a Google alert if you have high cholesterol that you're going to die of a heart attack. So we might find that there becomes a, a, a marker that's associated with something, and we will update that with, for you. Question right here. Uh, so earlier in the presentation, you mentioned that I think like several years ago, seven years ago, uh, this sort of process might have cost like a million dollars or something for a person. Is that right? So if it's now a thousand dollars, what do you expect it to be in five years? Uh, and, and the reason I'm wondering this is, you know, with the 23 and we concept, I mean, that's that sounds fascinating. And if you can get this down to a price point where really just, you know, it's it's free or 10 bucks for a person, then I expect that concept will really take off. We're, we're pushing in that direction. I mean, I think that's one of the great things with 23andMe and the other companies that are out there is that we're all creating more demand and we're all asking for lower pricing. And one of the problems when there was only one company is that there was not competition. And the other thing is, though, that we'll switch to full getting more information. So that what we're doing right now will absolutely drop. And so in the future, we may be able to offer what we have now at a very low price. But we think that people are going to want to get their full genome, which then might be $1,000. So there, there, there is a lot more opportunity to get more data, too. There's a question right here. OK. The kit is in my hand. Ah. You haven't discussed anything about error rates. Uh, and I keep thinking of the movie Brazil. And so, what's the you know, like, what's the probability of you know, like one single site uh, being you know like flipped wrong or you know, like any other data error measure? Yeah, um, the the one great thing about the genotyping arrays is they've been shown to be very reproducible, and the accuracy of the data is very high. And that that's w another reason that we felt like it was a good time to be giving people their own information because we have very high confidence in the genotype calls that are made. But that said, it is you know there is an error rate and. People need to keep in mind that these arrays aren't being designed right now as a diagnostic tool. So in the future, we may build in a lot more redundancy so that even if you have a failure in a SNP call, if we're calling it many times over, we'll be able to take that into account. So it is, it's a really good point. And, um, but the, you know, we, we, on most of these arrays, the, the, um, the concordance with other platforms and those sorts of things is about 99%. So it's very high. Yep. Oh, so I have a question. Uh, by the way, thank you for coming. I have a question about uh, HIPAA and research. Um, first, it seems pretty clear that HIPAA is obsolete. Um, it's also it's also been detrimental for um, getting research data. Um, so what I was wondering is basically on the research side, what what are you doing to sort of standardize data formats and data entry types? And on the HIPAA side, where do you think where do you see things going? Um, given that this I mean this completely falls outside of it, and just yeah, just what what do you view as where should where should things be in terms of health privacy? Yeah. So right now we are not um, we do not need to be HIPAA compliant. We um, you know again we take the data security because we recognize that there's some people who are not worried about their privacy and some people are very worried about it. So we we really want to give people that choice, and we do everything we can to protect the data and really give people options about it. Um, that said, I think you bring up really good points that there's not a lot of standardization here. Um, if we are working with a research group, you know, we need to comply with their, their you know, the data security policies with that. But, um, you know, but again, people are signing a 23andMe <coughs> consent form, and we see a lot of researchers who, you know, for right or wrong, actually see us as a way around some of these systems and actually are very excited. You know, oh, this is a whole new way of potentially doing research because these individuals have consented. They, through the 23andMe process, we can now then tie in researchers. Maybe more. Yeah, and it's, um, 
it's something that we're actually really excited about what Google Health is doing because that, you know, I think having a big company like Google, and I have to say Microsoft, taking on the challenge of getting information out of EMRs and into PHRs will really enable a lot better collection of the phenotypic information that we may need for studies. So that, that's something that, you know, we talked to Ronnie and the group uh, about what they're doing, and it's, it's just really exciting when someday we'll be able to merge a person's health record with their genetic information. You talked about how your company is very careful about security, and you also talked about the Gene Act being pass it, passed. Nevertheless, one can imagine some people might be uncomfortable about the service. Have you thought about a way for maybe people to uh, use the service anonymously at first, and then maybe join the social features later on as they become more comfortable? Yeah, you know, we actually, um, we were working with Brad Templeton early on at EFF, and, and, and he was very, you know, he was advocating exactly this point, you know, ha let someone just come in totally anonymously, have no records, um, you know, pay by PayPal or, or, I don't know if Google Checkout would work with this. Um, but, um, you know, and it's something, one of the things that we've realized is that the majority of people signing up are not that tight. Like, most of those people actually want to connect to other people and they want to share. And the sharing part has been so compelling. So you can sign up for an account and you do not have to share with anybody. So it's only because we've opted to share with people and we give you that option. We give you the option to never be contacted and to never be searchable. So, so right now we're trying, to, we're trying to do as much as we can within sort of the realm of real reality of who's likely to be signing up even for the service. Question over there. Yeah. Um, so I have... Um, I've seen a lot of absolute numbers on these slides, and uh, like some of them, for example, like 26% uh, chance for diabetes. And that doesn't mean anything if I don't understand the exact definition of, of how that uh, is defined. So I think it would be way more interesting to um, see if I uh, choose some population out of your database, how much more uh, of a chance do I have than those people, maybe my friends or you know just a people that I select, white people, whatever, you know, somebody. I think that would be way more interesting because and that also avoids that um, uh, people misunderstand the numbers, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. It's really complex information that we're trying to get across to people. And even that number 26%, you know, some diseases, when you look through the gene journals, the range is anywhere from 20 to 80%. You know, we don't even really understand what the genetic component is. And so as we get more people in the database, though, we would like to be able to share back with you how you stack up against people in 23andMe. So we definitely have plans to start doing those sorts of things. But it's just we're at the very beginning. OK. Uh, how do you see people working with their doctors with this information that they have. I'm picturing people are going to want to use all this information they get. And I'm, I'm picturing people marching into their doctor's offices saying, I'm 23% predisposed for this and 66 predisposed to that. So when people, when all this raw information is in the hands of the patients, but all the knowledge of what to do with it is in the hands of the doctors, do you see that causing a problem in the same way that like all the prescription drug commercials are causing that sort of problem? How is that going to work? Yeah, I think people are definitely going to walk into their doctor's offices with this information. And so a big component of what we want to do is educate everybody that's, you know, anyone who's interested in learning about this, this new um, field of, of personal genetics, uh, we're really encouraging doctors to sign up because we think if they have their own information, it's a really great way, great way for them to get educated so that if a patient walks in and says, hey, doc, I've got my gene journal report here, they can say, oh, yeah, I have one of those too. Um, it's really about everybody having information at the personal level that we think will push people in the right direction of learning about it. But it's, it's, it's going to be a process. But if we waited for the medical community to, to become educated about this, it would really, we just think it would be 100 years from now. Hi. I wanted to ask, in terms of um, the service, the discount you're giving is great. Um, but I wanted to see, will there be a subscription service following on, like a monthly fee? Because it sounds like you do follow-up and contact, and you're going to add more features as you learn. So I was just curious about price. Right, right now, we do not have a subscription fee. So it's $9.99 for um, you know, getting access to your information and at least a basic level. So what you've seen now is what we really consider the basic level and that you should always get access to that. Um, there might potentially be, you know, we talked about copy number variation. It, it's always possible that there could be other services that we offer that are an additional fee. But right now, you will always be entitled to a basic level of your service. 
Hi. Um, I noticed you did the haplogroup distribution based on 500 years ago. And I'm curious if you are also going to, since these are very ancient concepts, can you see ancestry going beyond 500 years? Oh, yeah. In fact, the tall guy in the very back, Chris, um, if you could find him, if you want to talk to him about that. He came, he came with Joanna from Stanford. <laughs> Wave, Chris. Um, that'd be a great question to ask him, but we definitely want to build out more information going all the way back. And that, that tree, actually, I didn't show you that, but the, um, the haplogroup tree really shows it going all the way back to, on the, ha on the maternal side, the mother of all mothers in Africa, and on the father's side, the father of all fathers. So Chris would be a great guy, though, to talk to about that. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. I hope you, re you do really well. Um, have you thought about what's going to happen to your data if you go out of business or if there's a hostile boardroom takeover from somewhere up north? <laughs> yeah. We, um, we actually have thought about a lot of those things. You know? And again, we re recognize that we have really sensitive information from an individual, and we need to be really responsible with that. So a couple things. If in the unfortunate circumstance we went out of business, you could either get a downloaded copy of your data, and we would just end up deleting everything. Um, um, or in the unfortunate circumstance, if there was some kind of hostile takeover, you know, we have, you know, we would give people that option of deleting their data. So again, it's one of those things that will always be transparent. We've tried to protect, similar to some of the things that Google has done, we've tried to protect against against any kind of hostile takeover. So it's actually one of the reasons why we do not have any VCs on the board. We only have Esther Dyson and us. Linda and I control the majority of the company. So it's, it's one of those things we've structured the company in such a way because we personally are so vested in this and we really want to change healthcare that we're not into this for maximizing. I mean, we want the company to do extremely well and we want it to be profitable, but fundamentally the bigger picture of changing the world with changing healthcare is what drives us. Um, can you talk about the law enforcement landscape for a bit? So will companies like yours be go-to resources for speculative scans of crime evidence, that sort of thing? Yeah, uh, we're, you know, I think what our, our policy and our, our, you know, how we look at our customers' data is that it belongs to our customers, and we're, we're just really the caretakers of that information, and we will protect it tooth and nail. And I think maybe similar to how Google responded to requests for going through data, we will be responding in the same way, that unless they're barring something that we can't avoid, we will not allow that kind of thing to happen. I, I think one of our guiding principles is that fundamentally there's no business if we can't protect your data. Um, so you talk about you know walking into the doctor's office with you know huge stack of of, of report. Uh, are you going to be able to filter things like you know just show me the part that has to do with heart disease related stuff or et cetera? Yeah, you know, on Gene Journal now we have a, a, a search function, um, so you could type in something like heart disease if you wanted to. We recognize that Gene Journal. Um, Gene Journal is going to go through a lot of evolution over the next nine months, and one of the things that we recognize, people want the data served up in different ways. And it might be that you only want to see where you really are an outlier in terms of from, from the average. So there's a lot of those things that it's exactly what we're working with. And again, Andro and Aaron, who have been leading up a lot of the Gene Journal write-ups, they're back there. You can go to the Gene Journal table. But there's a lot that we're hoping to redesign because we want to be able to allow people to you look, find data in whatever way they're interested in looking at it. So unfortunately, I think we need to, um, to stop the Q&A portion. But we're going to be here. So if you have questions, uh, we're happy to take any that you have. And again, there's a lot of 23 and mirrors in the back. Um, the other uh, thing we wanted to mention is that um, you can order as many kits today as you like at this price. So we're not limiting the number of kits. If you want to get them from family members, friends, whatever, um, please feel free to do that. So thank you so much. This has been really fun. Yeah.